Wow. <laughs> thank you very much. And I want to thank Bishop DiMarzio and Mike Paisano. We're kind of related, you know. And Monsignor Harrington, who is a real role model for all of us. Dear friends of the DeSales Media Group, I've been, been to many media conferences. I've never seen anything so well organized as this. You've chosen to honor me with the DeSales Distinguished Communicator Award this morning, but I wish to pay tribute to you, the DeSales Media Group, which I consider to be one of the finest Catholic media operations in North America. Your group, which is named after St. Francis de Sales, patron saint of writers and communicators and journalists, has specialized in the delivery of Catholic news, information, entertainment, and religious programs on many platforms simultaneously. Your creative works have crossed and united borders, cultures, and generations. And Salt and Light Television has the great pleasure of collaborating with you from our earliest days almost 14 years ago. What I admire very much about the work of DeSales is that you have avoided the great temptation in religious communications and broadcasting to remain prisoners of nostalgia and chained by the past. Instead, your activities and programs are firmly rooted in the Catholic tradition and pointed to a future of hope. You open doors to a faith that offers attractive, compelling answers to questions deep in the hearts of all men and women. And one of the stellar pieces of DeSales Media is that young people, young adults, competent young adults are in the front lines. Isn't this the heart of the Petrine ministry of Pope Francis? Aren't the lessons that DeSales offers to the world what he's been trying to teach us over the past three years? Contrary to some voices which think that Francis is a great revolutionary who has rocked the boat or even sunk the ship in some circles, Francis has not overturned Catholic doctrine and age-old beliefs that are the bedrock of our Catholic faith. He simply wishes to make these teachings understandable and part of our lives. He has the bold and courageous behavior to ask deep questions, and he is unafraid to start a conversation and remain with it. Francis rejects the reduction of Catholicism to a whole list of hot-button topics. He does not want to reduce the church only to discussions and heated debates. Francis makes a distinction between dogmatic and moral teachings, reminding us that they do not hold the same weight. With Francis, the church must re-enter the public discourse with a full-throated defense, full defense of the common good that rises above bitter partisan divisions that have poisoned our cultures, I say cultures, in North America. We must stand for something much greater than division, rancor, labeling, and meanness of spirit that have dominated politics and infected the church. Francis calls for a church of and for the poor that is not turned in on itself, but a church that's in the streets. He reminds us forcefully that the culture of prosperity deadens us. He speaks with authority and integrity because he's lived the church's social teachings all of his life in Argentina. His love for Jesus Christ is contagious, and we are all infected by it. This elderly man, elderly bishop from Argentina, walks his talk and walks the walk. In his highly appropriate and very timely message for this year's World Day of Communications, celebrated this past Sunday, Ascension Sunday, Francis chose the theme, Communication and Mercy, a fruitful encounter is the theme of this year's Communications Day. At the heart of the 2016 message, the 50th message since the Council, we have the theme of the mercy of God. It is so complementary to the special Jubilee Year of Mercy that's being experienced throughout the Universal Church. A Jubilee Year which Francis says is called to practice mercy as the distinctive trait of all that she is and does. Our primary task is to uphold the truth with love. Some of the key points of this year's message, which I know all of you have read, are the following. We are reminded that to communicate in an authentic manner, we must be able to listen to rather than merely hear when we encounter another person. If our hearts and actions are inspired by charity, by divine love, 
then our communication will be touched by God's own power. As sons and daughters of God, we are called to communicate with everyone without exception. Christians ought to be constant, constant encouragement, to be a constant encouragement to communion, and even in those cases where they must firmly condemn evil, they should never try to rupture relationships and communication. Our political and diplomatic language would do well to be inspired by mercy, which never loses hope. Mercy can also help mitigate life's troubles and offer warmth to those who have known only the coldness of judgment. May our way of communicating, says the Pope, help to overcome the mindset that neatly separates sinners from the righteous. We can and we must judge situations of sin, such as violence, corruption, and exploitation. But we may not judge individuals, since only God can see into the hearts, the depths of their hearts. Our primary task is to uphold the truth with love. And listening is never easy. Many times it's easier to play deaf. Listening means paying attention, wanting to understand, to value, to respect, and to ponder what the other person says. Time and time again over the past three years, Francis has reminded us of the necessity of dialogue with others. And this is a very important part of our mission in the area of Catholic media and broadcasting. Each and every one of us, especially those in this room, is called to be an instrument and an agent of peace by uniting and not dividing, by extinguishing hatred and not holding on to it, by opening paths to dialogue and not by constructing new walls. When the Pope addressed the bishops of the United States last September in St. Matthew's Cathedral, Pope Francis said to his brother bishops these words, and yet we are promoters of the culture of encounter. We are living sacraments of the embrace between God's richness and our poverty. We are witnesses of the abasement and the condescension of God who anticipates in love our every response. Dialogue is our method, not as shrewd strategy, but out of fidelity to the one who never wearies of visiting the marketplace, even at the 11th hour, to propose his offer of love. And he continued, the path ahead then is dialogue among yourselves, dialogue in your presbyterates, dialogue with laypersons, dialogue with families, dialogue with society. I can ev never tire of encouraging you, I cannot ever tire of encouraging you to dialogue fearlessly. The richer the heritage which you are called to share with paresia, boldness, the more eloquent should be the humility with which you offer it. Do not be afraid to set out on that exodus which is necessary for all authentic dialogue. Otherwise, we fail to understand the thinking of others or to realize deep down that the brother or sister we wish to reach and redeem with the power and closeness of love counts more than their positions, distant as they may be from what we hold as true and certain. Harsh and divisive language does not befit the tongue of a pastor. It has no place in this heart, although it may momentarily seem to win the day only the enduring allure of goodness and love remains truly convincing." End of quote. Last Friday, at the Vatican, when the Pope received the prestigious Charlemagne Prize in a marvelous ceremony, Francis once again emphasized the necessity and capacity for dialogue. He spoke these provocative words in what I consider to be his I Have a Dream speech of this pontificate and present were the leaders of many European nations. He said, if there is one word that we should never tire of repeating, it is this, dialogue. We are called to promote a culture of dialogue by every possible means and thus to rebuild the fabric of society. The culture of dialogue entails a true apprenticeship and a discipline that enables us to view others as valid dialogue partners, to respect the foreigner, the immigrant, and people from different cultures as worthy of being listened to. The culture of dialogue should be an integral part of the education imparted in our schools, cutting across disciplinary lines and helping to give young people the tools needed to settle conflicts differently than we are accustomed to. Today we urgently need to build coalitions that are not only military and economic, but cultural, educational, philosophical, and religious. Coalitions that can make clear that beyond many conflicts, there is often in play the power of economic groups, 
coalitions capable of defending people from being exploited for improper ends. Let us arm our people with the culture of dialogue and encounter. These words were not only addressed to the political and diplomatic efforts of nations, nor to the Episcopal ministry of bishops in this country, but to the mission and vocation of every one of us involved in Catholic communications, broadcasting, and media. How do we allow our media platforms to become transmitters of the rich and beautiful tradition of the Catholic tradition, while at the same time serving as instruments of dialogue with peoples, traditions, and the cultures around us, many of which can often be hostile to us? How do our platforms and various entities build bridges with individuals and within families, social groups and peoples? How do we become agents and vehicles of tenerezza e misericordia, tenderness and mercy? Or do we simply contribute to the acrimony, the division, the vengeance, the condemnation and the hatred present in so many parts of the world and present in this country at this moment and in the country from which I come? In his vision for blueprint for ministry, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis criticizes forces within the church who seem to lust for veritable witch hunts, asking rhetorically, whom are we going to evangelize if this is the way we act? Francis wants the church to be an instrument of reconciliation and welcome, a church of dialogue, a church capable of warming hearts, a church that is never bent over on herself but always seeking those on the periphery, those who are lost, a church capable of leading people home. After three years at the helm of the church, we must ask ourselves, what has been the most important achievement of this bishop from that faraway country? I believe that he's rebranded Catholicism in the papacy. Prior to Francis, when many peoples on the street were asked, what's the Catholic Church all about? And this we often did as streeters for our television network, going into main squares and big cities. What's the church all about? What does the Pope stand for? And almost always we heard, well, Catholics, they're against abortion. They're against gay marriage. They're against birth control. They're known for the sex abuse crisis, which has terribly marred and weakened their moral authority and credibility. Today, I dare say that while some of those answers may be the same, the playing field has changed. What do people say about us now? What are they saying? They talk about the Pope. They're speaking about our leader who's unafraid to confront the sins and evils that have marred us. We've got a Pope who's concerned about the environment, who's impassioned with mercy, who's filled with compassion and love, who's got a care and concern for the poor and especially for displaced peoples roaming across the face of the earth. Francis has won over in great part the secular media. By no means is this an indication that the teachings of the church and the message of the gospel have been fully understood or received by all. Nevertheless, there is a level of interest now that I have never experienced before. And I can attest to this, especially in my work on behalf of the Holy See Press Office with the English language media outlets around the world. Something has shifted in terms of church media relations. Many of my colleagues in the secular media industry have said that Francis has actually made it fun to be a religious reporter, religion reporter, and a journalist again. He's changed the image of the church so much that numerous prestigious graduate schools of business and management are now using him as a case study in rebranding. Now, he's ruffled many feathers and upset some folks because of his free-flowing, unscripted remarks at times. And he does raise a few eyebrows now and then. But the fact is, people are talking and people are interested. The inability of some media commentators to pigeonhole Francis into a single category is frustrating to some people. He does not compromise on the hot-button issues that divide the church from the secular West, a gap that liberals would like to close by modernizing or dismissing doctrine. Yet he's also not a pope for the Catholic right. For him, contrasting positions held together in tension, loyal to fundamentals but open to the action of the Holy Spirit, are necessary to forge a new, better consensus, and the differences make for an honest, open discussion. He has clearly revived the Synod of Bishops from a long slumber period. It was known as siesta sessions. 
I can assure you that there were no siestas at the past synods. Francis wants us to be warm, welcoming, and forgiving as Jesus is modeled to us on every single page of the New Testament. Some people say, this is the Pope from Argentina. So hold on, folks. This is a Pope from Galilee. This is a Pope who's modeling his papacy on the New Testament and on the ministry of Jesus. He wants us to eat with tax collectors and sinners, to forgive the woman caught in adultery while admonishing her to sin no more. He wants us to welcome and respect foreigners, even our enemies, and above all, not to judge others. He's spoken simply, powerfully, and beautifully about returning to a lost unity, a desire to achieve a missing fullness, a disarming invitation to simply come together to witness to the beauty and the love of Christ. He wants to build bridges so everyone can cross them. He's especially conscious of the poor and the marginalized social outcasts on the peripheries or the fringes of society. In this year's message for the World Day of Communications, he says these words, communication has the power to build bridges to enable encounter and inclusion and thus to enrich society. How beautiful it is when people select their words and actions with care in the effort to avoid misunderstandings, to heal wounded memories, and to build peace and harmony. Words can build bridges between individuals and within families, social groups, and with people. This is possible both in the material world and the digital world. Our words and actions should be such as to help us all to escape the vicious cycles of condemnation and vengeance which continue to ensnare individuals, nations that encourage expressions of hatred. The words of Christians ought to be a constant encouragement to communion. Even in those cases where they must firmly condemn evil, they should never try to rupture relationships and communications. Let me conclude by taking up one of Francis's very beautiful images, a favorite image, which has certainly been seized by many people, the powerful image of the field hospital. This expression is not unique to Francis. For any one of us who's been trained or imbued or affected or impacted by Ignatian spirituality and the Jesuits knows that the expression field hospital is drawn from the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. When Francis speaks of the church as a field hospital after battle, he's appealing to Ignatius' understanding of the role of the church in light of God's gaze upon the world. So many people ask us to be close to them. They ask us what they were asking of Jesus, to be close to him, to be near him, to be with him. The image of the field hospital is the, um, the opposite image of a fortress under siege. The image of a field hospital is not just a simple, pretty, poetic metaphor. From this very image, we can derive an understanding of both the church's mission and the sacraments of salvation. Field hospitals, by their very nature, indicate a battleground, a struggle, suffering, confusion, emergency, and they foster dialogue and encounter, conversation and meeting, consolation, compassion, and the binding of wounds. I want to offer you two areas where field hospitals are badly needed in our media and communications efforts, projects, and programs. And not only hospitals are needed, but caregivers willing to step into the battle, roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty, become stained by the people that are attending these hospitals. There is no question that the church has entered the whole world of new media with great bravado and zeal. The sales media is a perfect example of that. I'm concerned at times that we do enter this world without a lot of careful reflection on what's really happening in this new universe. Does the use of new media serve to deepen our attentiveness to the presence of God and to the risen Christ, to the living spirit, to the community gathered around us, and to the world in which we are called to minister? In the digital world, no matter how hasty, undigested, unreflective the responses may be from our audience, our patient listening must always triumph. Internet and digital culture condition us to think that quick, instant, nanosecond responses to complex questions are the most valuable responses. But it is then that we teachers and pastors and agents of communication become choreographers of immediacy rather than midwives of a slower wisdom. 
Francis warns us, quote, some people want their interpersonal relationships provided by sophisticated equipment, by screens and systems which can be turned on and off, friended or unfriended. He continues, the gospel tells us, we run the risk of face-to-face -face encounters with others, with their physical presence, which challenges us with their pain and their pleas, with their joy which infects us. Evangelii Gaudium, paragraph 88. Let me identify a second battleground where a field hospital is badly needed in our efforts, and so with the field hospital caregivers, emergency responders. We can each name a country or a land where blood, terror, and violence seem to have the upper hand right now. But the big battlefield before humanity is also in the digital world, one that requires no passport or airline ticket to enter. You simply need a keyboard, a screen, a handheld device, and a blog, sometimes with a Latin title. It is in that universe that many wars are waged each day where many souls live, walk, or troll. It is an immense battleground that needs many field hospitals to set up to bind wounds and reconcile warring parties, if indeed that's possible. In this wild and crazy world of the Catholic blogosphere, there is the challenge of accountability and responsibility. On the internet, there is no accountability, no code of ethics, and no responsibility for one's words or actions. It can be an international weapon of mass destruction crossing time zones and borders and space. And in its wake, we have character assassination, destruction of reputation, calumny, libel, slander, and defamation. What views do others have of us when they view our blogs? If we judged our identity based on certain Catholic websites or blogs, people would think that we are the people who are against everyone and everything. If anything, we should be known as the people who are for something, who are for people, who are for Jesus, and who are for the leaders that Jesus provides for us. To what degree are our social media entities, projects, blogs, websites, tweets, are they part of the wealth of the Christian patrimony successful in transmitting the good news that the Lord has invited us to spread? Many of my non-Catholic and non-believing friends have remarked to me that we Catholics have often turned the internet into a cesspool of venom and vitriol, a graveyard of corpses strewn all around, condemnations issued left and right. I remember how many people were upset when Benedict came out with his first encyclicals. Deus caritas est. How can he be speaking about God as love? Spe salvi. We are saved by hope and caritas and veritate with profound messages. Benedict was not the hammer of God. He was the heart of God inviting us into mercy, into hope, into love. And Francis is showing us how to do that every day. On these new battlefields today, the church must shine with the light that shines within itself. It must go out and encounter human beings who even before they believe that they do not need to hear a message of salvation, find themselves afraid and wounded by life. The light of Christ reflected in the church must not become the privilege of only a few elect who float within a safe harbor or ghetto network of communications for the elite, the clean, the perfect, and the saved. This would be a church click, a personal blog, or a chat room more than an ecclesial community of faith. From the Pope's message for this year's World, Youth, World Day of Communications, let us never forget this one point. Communication, whenever and however it takes place, has opened up broader horizons for many people. This is a gift of God which involves a great responsibility. In a broken, fragmented, and polarized world, to communicate with mercy means to help create a healthy, free, and fraternal closeness between the children of God and all of our brothers and sisters in the human family. Thank you, DeSales Media, with the privilege of being here to witness and experience what you have done. Thank you for the honor you've given me with the DeSales Award. If we remember Francis DeSales today, it's not for the call to holiness for all people and all, is it not for the call to holiness for all people in all walks of life? The necessity of living in the present moment is the privileged opportunity to know and live God's will, the goodness of creation, the centrality of love and freedom in one's relationship with God and the world, the sanctity of the ordinary done passionately well, 
and the gentleness, humility, optimism, and joy that come from living in truthfulness. This was the core of Francis de Sales' spirituality in his day. Francis of Buenos Aires teaches us the same thing. He's a mover and shaker of human hearts and consciences, a living witness to what, to what happens when communications and mercy embrace and meet. Let us learn from him how to model this badly needed kindness, goodness, mercy, and joy to a wounded world and a broken humanity around us. Thank you very much.